Thank you, Lord, for your many, many blessings to us. Thank you that we don't just have what we need, but we have so much more. And uh, we thank you for our physical needs and, most importantly, our spiritual needs that you've met in Christ. So, Lord, please bless uh, the offering that we've uh, given this week. And we do pray, Lord, that you'd use it for your glory, both here in this ministry here and far, far away where the name of Jesus has not been heard. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll need your Bibles. And uh, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll turn there as well. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're looking at the second part of this chapter today, so starting from verse 6. Paul writes, he says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by the prophecy when the council of the elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us the Bible to do us good and to change us. So please help us as I... Look at this passage today. Help all of us as we listen that we might pay attention and do what it says. In Jesus' name, amen. You know how this is. You've been at work before, been at school. Uh, the situation, she walked into the office on her first day in her new job, on time, neatly dressed, ready for work. And what did she see? She was surprised. She saw... Rubbish on the floor, half-eaten sandwiches on the chairs, paper all over the place. And over the next 45 minutes, her colleagues shuffled into work, shirts hanging out, looking all hungover from a night that was long. And she came in on time, and she was alert and tidy, but I guarantee you, give it a month, maybe even less than that, she would come in late, scruffy, hungover, just like everyone else. That's the importance of or the pressure of low expectations. But turn it around. In contrast, here's a guy who stumbles into work on his first day. He's half an hour late. He's scruffy, and everybody glances up from their desk, but they're hard at work already. They got there early. The boss motions for him to come and have a chat. And if he <laughs> stays in that job, I guarantee you that, you know, he would arrive early. And he'd be there ready and tidy and, uh, and awake. The pressure of high expectations, right? You and I are hugely affected by the expectations of those around us in school, at university, at work, uh, wherever it may be. The expectations of those around us will affect us for good or for bad, um, more than we'd like to realize. First Timothy is a letter. Uh, if you turn back to chapter 1, verse 2, you'll notice it's addressed to only one person, which is unusual for Paul's letters, because usually they're addressed to whole churches, the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth. But this is addressed, 
from Paul to Timothy. But it's not a private letter. It's not just for Timothy. If you turn over to the very last chapter of the book, uh, chapter 6, the very final verse, he says, uh, this is 621, grace be with you. And it doesn't, it doesn't show in our English translations, but the you in the original is actually plural. So in Kentucky, where I used to live, it was always y'all. That's you, know, you all, right? We don't really say that in our language, but you all. And that's quite clear in this letter, that even though Paul is writing to Timothy, uh, this was an open letter. That is to say, they expected to re everybody to read this letter. Um, I, I imagine they probably had a gathering and they would read it all out together. Why? Well, the reason is this, I think, that when Paul says to Timothy, as he does in this morning's passage, this is what you've got to do if you want to be a good minister of Christ Jesus instead of a bad minister, instead of a minister that doesn't care about anything, he wants the rest of the church to hear. It's kind of like our AGM, right? In fact, what I'm saying here is kind of my AGM talk, so you can be blessed with that. But he wants the rest of the church to hear this because their expectations then will be right, correct. And if their expectations are right, then Timothy will move in the right direction. And I think he already is, obviously. The temptation here for us is that if you were paying attention as I read that, that text, it's talking about uh, being a good minister of the Lord Jesus, of Christ Jesus. And the temptation is to say, oh, okay, he's talking about ministry, he's talking about being a pastor. I'm just going to switch off. I hope Tom's paying attention. Tom always pays attention. I hope Leroy's paying attention. I hope, I hope the elders are paying attention. Um, and maybe, you know, one or two others. Um, but the rest of us can doze off, right? Not so. The reason is, this is public. This is for everybody. And you all need to understand the expectations that you ought to have for your ministers, for your pastors. Because if you have right expectations... Hopefully, we will continue to move in the right direction. I think we are, right? AGM stuff again, right? Uh, you'll get the pastors you need in the future. I want, I want to be here for a long, long time, but there might come a time where you have to find a new pastor. You need to have the right expectations for that. So that's one reason you need to pay attention. Another reason is, did you see the emphasis in our text about Timothy being an example, right? Right? So verse 12, this is a great verse for young people to memorize if you haven't done that before. Verse 12, 412. Let no one despise you or look down on you for your youth, but set the believers an example, a model of speech, conduct, in love, and faith, in purity. And then go down to verse 15. He says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. You saturate yourself in these things so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. Persevere. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So Timothy is to set an example. And he is to be a model. And then the point of being an example is that others might see and follow, right? And I'm hoping that's what happens here with our leadership and with our pastors and so on. They will see his progress. They will be mentored by him and they will grow as well. So the point of being a model, an example, is that others might imitate that example. You know, Paul says in another place, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that's important. All right, so I'm just saying all that. Don't switch off, right? Pay attention. This is for everybody, not just Tom and Leroy and me. All right, here are my points. His training, a good minister of Christ Jesus. Look at his training, look at his example, look at his work, and look at his diligence. First of all, his training. Verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, in other words, if you put in front of the church the teaching of this letter, the gospel, the Bible's teaching, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Being trained, note that's present tense, right? It's present continual tense. It's not something that happened 30 years ago and he stopped being trained. It's a continuing process in Timothy's life. He's being trained, and trained means nourished and, and fed and, 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 and helped by the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So Paul begins with the private life of the pastor, the inner life, as the Puritans used to call it. 
what's going on in the private life of the pastor, the times when nobody else is watching and paying attention. He says to Timothy, if you're going to be a good minister, you've got to be continually, continually nourished by the word of God, the truths of the gospel. You've got to be the sort of person that in your hidden life, in your office, in your bedroom, you're always being nourished and fed by the gospel. That is to say, if you're going to be a, a teacher, a teacher, you've got to be a continual learner all the time. We have L plates in our car right now. You can go out there and check. Uh, Joel drove to church this morning, and he's doing very, very well, right? Um, but we look forward to the day. He's the fourth child of ours to go through this. So we look forward to the day that we will throw those L plates away altogether. Not that he won't keep on getting better, but there will come a time where he takes that test and he passes that test and he won't have to have the L plates in there any longer. But the pastor puts on L plates, learner plates, and he keeps them on to the end. All right? Because to be a good minister of Christ Jesus means, as a means for any Christian, not just the minister, that we need to be learners. We need to be keep on learning. What kind of learning? Well, it's a different kind of learning to what the false teachers were doing. And this is in the background of the letter in Ephesus. Because there were people in Ephesus, back in chapter 1 we met them, who were certainly learners, but Paul says they devoted themselves to myths and to endless genealogies. They loved the Bible because they found it so stimulating, so interesting, so fascinating. Uh, so they were certainly learners. They lapped it up because it tickled their intellect. But what they didn't do... And this is the heart of the matter with them. They didn't relate what they had learned in the Bible to their lives. They didn't, they didn't apply it to their lives. It was just academic. And the theme of this letter, in a way, as I've said, is that link between what we learn and how we act, between our conduct and our learning, between the Bible's teaching and our lives, life and doctrine. So Paul says to Timothy, first, don't have anything, this is in verse 7, don't have anything to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, as the NIV puts it. In other words, a sort of empty chatter, the, the old wives' tales, irreverent, silly myths, ESV says. That's what these false teachers were into. They, they were into the fascinating little speculations about the Bible, and they lapped that stuff up. It was just controversy. Oh, did you hear what so-and-so said? Oh, here's the video for that. Speculation about this and that. Don't have anything to do with that. Paul says. Rather, here's the contrast, verse 7, train yourself to be godly. It's really gymnos, it's gymnastic kind of language in the Greek. Let your reading of the Bible, your being nurtured by the Bible, feed into your life so that it changes you, so that it has a bearing on how you act. Verse 8, because bodily training, physical training, is of some value. We know that, right? I go bike riding every day if I can, or you, know, you go jogging, or you go, you know, anything that gets you sweating and puffing and panting and doing weight training. Some of you guys do that as well. It does do us some good in this life. That's obvious. But Paul says, here's what has much greater value than that. You work on your character. You train yourself to be godly, to be more patient next year than you are right now to be more loving, to be less concerned with yourself next year than you are right now, to grow. And us elders, we get together and we notice you all when you grow. We'll say, oh, did you see so-and-so? Wow. Compare them to a year ago. Wow, they're really growing. They're training. They're, they're disciplined in their Christian lives. And they're setting a great example. So you train yourself to change your character with the Holy Spirit's help. Right? You, you take that um, on and uh, you, you go through this life and what you learn has value for the next life not just this life but also the next verse 8 and that's worth working at right it's worth it's worth the, what you're doing as you ride your bike max is good for right now but also what you're doing in private with the word of God and God changing your character has eternal value right so verse 9 the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. This is the third time that Paul said that in this letter. It's a, it's a phrase that means this is really important. Pay attention. For to this end we toil and we strive and we train this work of being a pastor 
Because we have our hope set on the living God. Who? Here's why. Because God is the Savior. He's the Savior. This gospel, this message of the good news, is a message that saves people, changes lives, and it's worth working and toiling and, and training in his service. He's the Savior, verse 10, of all people, especially of those who believe. Now, when we read that phrase, he's the Savior of all people, especially those who believe, we ought to be a little bit puzzled, I think. Uh, what's that mean? Because in our English translations, it's a bit kind of vague in a general sense. Is it saying that God saves everybody? You know, it doesn't matter what you are, who you are, what you believe, God saves everybody. Here's probably what it means, because we know what the Bible teaches elsewhere, right? What Jesus says about him being the only way, the truth, and the life. So he can't possibly mean that, that uh, you know, there's other ways to God besides Jesus. That's made clear elsewhere. But that word, um, especially in my Bible, can also mean, you know, namely, or it has the sense of what I mean is, right? So God is the Savior of all people. What I mean is those who believe, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying God is the Savior of all people. No distinction. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, if you're old, if you're young, if you're from Malaysia or Mongolia or whatever. There's no distinction you come to Christ, you rely upon Jesus' work for you, and you will be rescued from the wrath to come. That's the marvelous gospel. And so he says to Timothy, you need to train yourself, work at it, sweat at it, be nurtured by this gospel so that in your inner life you're growing and you'll be in your outward life changing and maturing. And you, you'll be able to keep going as a pastor. So that's the first point. But note that this takes time. Now, Timothy's got to read his Bible for himself. He's got to spend time over it, studying, thinking, mulling it over in his head, talking it over with others, working out what it means and how it applies to his life. And this takes time. And it's not time for which he's going to get credit. Everything we do in this life these days is like to get credit. You, know, you want people to notice what you have done. And it's one of the things that really irks me about social media these days, that everybody has to put up there whatever, so they get credit for it, and they get some affirmation from people. It's a, take a look at me, here's a selfie of this and that. And I was going to say that when you spend time studying the Bible and praying, people won't know, and they won't give you credit for it. But now there's this trend, especially in America, where they do selfies. Here I am reading my Bible. Here I am praying. It, this is true. Or in a church service, here I am worshiping God. And that happens uh, in Perth as well. I've seen those too. So I was going to say, people don't know, but I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> what I was going to say is, when you study and keep deep communion with God and apply his word to your life, people won't know. You won't get credit for that. People won't give you kudos and he'll like when you read your Bible and have your private time with the Lord. We live in a culture where we, we want credit for everything that we do. And the pastor, he knows, the pastor knows you get credit for visiting the sick and making those phone calls. And, you know, people will say, hey, the pastor called me today. Wow, that's really good. Or, you know, doing a good sermon, if it really is good, they'll, they'll give kudos to him for that. And, but you know perfectly well that you're not going to get kudos for secret, private time with the Lord. And you'll have no idea how much time Tom spent in private and Dad spent in private praying and, and reading the Bible. But I'll tell you this, in the longer term, you will. You will. And I find in my life, when I'm close to feeling like I'm going to burn out, the first place I look at is, how's my private time with the Lord going? Because if I'm not spending time in private with Him and praying and reading the Bible, I will not last. All right? So you need to pray that your pastors, and you yourself, that you keep up with this. So pastors burn out for all kinds of reasons, but this is one of them. And you need to be a church. Are you, are you hearing me today? Here or any other church you decide to go to that expects those in church leadership to spend time privately being nurtured by the truth of the gospel. And you won't see it. I don't want them to give you selfies of that. But you will see it in the, in the long term. That's the first point. Second, it needs to work out in life. And that's my second point, his example. He used to be a believer, Timothy, who lives it out. He's not to be like that long reading I gave you in Matthew 23 
of those hypocrites that Jesus was talking about. He used to be an example to those around him as he lives out his Christian life. Now, Timothy has got a problem. Verse 11, he's told to command and teach these things. And the word command there is a military word, parangelo, which means to give an order, to command. And Timothy's told he's got to exercise authority in his church at Ephesus and to say to these false teachers, you must not do this and you must do this. And, and not just to command, he's to teach, verse 11, and to give reasons for it. But his problem is, verse 12, he is young. young. <laughs> I remember my first church. Um, I was visiting a nursing home, and our church was quite well known back then. And this older lady came up and goes, I hear there's a young boy that's preaching at Turkey Foot now. And I said, oh, that's, that's me. And I was very young. I was, I was 20, so I looked really, really young. Now I'm getting gray, right? So Timothy is really young, maybe his early 30s. We don't know for sure. He, he was called into ministry with Paul uh, partway through his first missionary journey, through the second missionary journey. Um, so maybe now he's in his 30s. I don't know, he, but he's young. But the guys he has to stand up against in this church are older than him. And they will look down their noses at him and they will say, who is this snotty-nosed upstart telling us what to do? You know, who is he? Who does he think he is? That's what's going on in Ephesus. Now, how would you respond or how do we respond in our world when we are younger and we're given authority and power, let's say at work, and you have to change the culture in which you're living? The way our society responds is to become bossy. You know, you get this young guy, he's the boss. He has to exercise his authority, and he will. So he will be bossy and authoritarian. I remember some movie years ago that was about a young guy taking over an office, an older guy. Anyway, that's the way the world is. But the way that Paul tells Timothy to command authority, verse 12, is the way of the gospel. Verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth. Instead of that, but, but, set the believers an example. And he's to command authority simply by the way he lives. So the way he lives gives him authority to say what he needs to say. So that when they see the way he works out the gospel in practice in his life, that commands respect and authority. Do you, you follow that? So not shouting not bullying, not political power plays like our world, but by being a good example. And youth, you ought to memorize this verse, 1 Timothy 4.12. No notice all the ways in which he used to set an example. His speech, the false teachers like to talk a lot. They like to babble. It's all, it's all light and empty kind of stuff. It doesn't change lives. But Timothy's words are to have gravitas. They're to have weight so that the people pay attention, because when he speaks, it means something. It's, it's powerful. It's God's word. He's known for godly, weighty conversation that doesn't simply entertain. It draws people closer to the Lord, right? So in the right sense, in the right context, his words are serious. Not that he doesn't have a sense of humor, but he's serious about the word. His life, second thing, the false teachers' lives are immoral. We talked about this, the false teachers. Timothy's life is to be Christ-like. His love, false teachers, they're motivated by greed. They want reputation, role number one. They want money and influence for themselves, and they're going to step on people to get to it. But Timothy, young Timothy, he's to be motivated by a real sincere concern for others. A real love for others. He used to love his flock. Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes that, it's work sometimes, right? But we love our flock. And then faith in Christ, or it can also mean his faithfulness. And I think that's kind of the sense here, his faithfulness. That he will continue. And what he says he means, and he will keep his word he won't, he won't go back on his word, and you can expect him to be trusted and to continue in that church situation or whatever it might be. His purity, next thing is purity. It's a word which mainly refers to his behavior in the realm of sex. We talked about this. He used to be a one-woman man. 
or whatever it might be. The, the false teachers have flexible sexual morals. They're immoral, but Timothy is to be pure. Now, the point I want to make there is that our society as a whole, and you know this, doesn't really value these things. What, what do we got there? Godly speech, Christ-like behavior, purity, love, faithfulness. The world around us doesn't really value those things. It's kind of dull in their eyes. By and large, we live in a society which values entertainment and money and celebrity. The most famous people in the world, the social influencers, whatever they call themselves now, who are they? They are the entertainers. They're the ones that make us laugh. They're the Kardashians. They're the sports heroes. They're the millionaires of millionaires. They're not known for these traits that we're talking about here. And by and large, if anybody ever talks about a minister in our society and they want to praise him, they'll praise him for his entertainment value. <laughs> He's got great teeth. Oh, his smile is... His, the books that he has, oh, he tells good jokes or whatever. But we ought to value, church, we ought to value these qualities of trustworthiness, speech, purity, life, love, and so on. And if we look at those things, it will help keep our pastors up to the mark. So here's, here's Timothy. He's a teacher who learns. He's to be a believer who it works out in his life and his example. But what should he do? What's his work? How are we doing here? Good. The answer to that third question, what should he do, is absolutely critical. It's vitally important. It's at the heart why so many churches aren't doing very well, uh, because they don't understand this third point. We need to understand this, and I think that we do. So if I was going to say, here's my report, church, for AGM, here's what my, my main things are, three things. Look what Timothy, Paul, Paul says. Verse 13, until I come, so Paul's hoping to come visit, uh, Timothy in Ephesus, um, until I come, devote yourself. So, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Devote yourself, which is a strong word. It means to give yourself entirely or wholeheartedly to these things. To what? To the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, that's preaching, and to teaching. So, verse 14 don't, don't neglect this gift that you have which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Now, verse 14, we don't know exactly what it refers to there. But I take it that at some point, Timothy was, was set apart. He was commissioned, and the council of elders and the leadership of the church, uh, we, we learn this in 2 Timothy, that Paul was there, he was a part of it, and they laid their hands on him to commission him, and somebody had given this prophetic message, and, and he'd been given a gift, and they've been recognized, I think it's probably the gift of what we would call Bible teaching. And Paul says, don't neglect this. This is your work. This is what a pastor is to be and to do. Be a Bible teacher. And he's to, to devote himself to these things. So three things. The public reading of Scripture. In other words, making sure it's, it's more than just reading the Bible. It's not less. All right? So making sure that the Bible is read out loud so that we are soaked in it, that we are saturated in it, that, that every time we get together as a church, it's not just a fun, you know, go, go do this kind of thing, but we'll include the Bible in our conversation, and if we need to formally, to read the Bible, and we're always talking about the Bible, and, and the words of the Bible worm themselves into all of our thinking and conversations. So, so the Bible is not just an add-on. It, it's just, it's totally what we're about. I used to go to a prayer meeting for a bunch of young people, and I was young then, and we would pray for our churches, and we would talk about in our churches. We didn't tell each other exactly where we were, but how we were using the Bible in our churches. And this one gal would say, oh, this week we actually got asked to open our Bible. We read some scripture. It was so unusual for her. And uh, we would pray about that church. We need to, we are, but we need to continue being a church that's saturated with God's word. Here's what Spurgeon said. He's talking about, Dad uses this, being bibbling or bubbling. Bibbling? In your bloodstream, you are just bleeding the Bible. And Spurgeon says this. Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought to we do with the word of, God, of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right there into it till we've taken it into our most inward parts. It's idle merely to let the eye glance over the words 
or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historical facts, but it's blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you have come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned on scriptural models and what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. Then he says, I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his. What did he write? Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress, you know this. Read anything of his and you will see that it's almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read it till his very soul was saturated with scripture, and though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, why, this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere. His blood is bibbling. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text. For his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved, says Spurgeon. We ought to be the kind of people who in our church were getting so full of the Bible that the words of God just, they, they spring to mind. Are oh, you talking about, you know, this, oh, the Bible says this. And, and we don't even have to, like, think about it. It just flows from us. Now, we live in a different time than Spurgeon and Bunyan, of course, as well. We live in a time where people don't know God's word too well. They come in, they become Christians. They don't have that background. So it's so important that we, in our discipleship, teach people how this fits in, what the context is, what it means, and so on. We laugh on, we, I watch them. Um, I'm OCD about this, about watching the chase every night. Because we're getting ready for dinner, and it's you know, 5.36, and we're watching the chase. And we take note of how many times they have... They had two or three questions this week about the Bible, and the guy did quite well. One was, who is called the Lamb of God in the Bible? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. You all know this. All right. So the public reading of Scripture is so important that you might remember it. Secondly, Paul calls uh, the next thing, exhortation or preaching to exhort, to urge. It's, it's active encouragement. It's what sets a sermon apart from a lecture, right? Uh, this right now is not a nice little theological lesson for you to learn. It's an act of urging for you to leave this place and put it into practice. That's what makes it a sermon. So we need to public reading of scripture, rub your nose in the Bible, saturate yourself with the Bible, but then be urged to do it. And this is the second thing that Timothy is told to do. You ought to do it. You need to do it, he's saying. Second thing is that. Third thing, teaching, teaching. So we're, we're appealing for people to change. And then the teaching part is explaining what the Bible means. So we see how it all fits together and what the truths are, what the doctrines are, why it's believable so that we understand it. This is what used to happen in the synagogues back in the Jewish times. Someone would, would stand up and read the scripture and then somebody would sit down in the front and explain it, explain it for people to do it. Here's an early Christian. This is first, second century Christian named Justin Martyr. Can you imagine having that name, Justin Martyr? I wonder if he was given that name at the end. Um, anyway, on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles, that'd be like this, right, the letters of Paul and so on, or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits, you know, the time today and still, and then when the reader has ceased, the president, and I take this to be the, the preacher, uh, verbally instructs and exhorts the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. That's the work of the pastor. It's been going on for 2,000 years or longer. And this is how we're to assess a sermon. We tend to assess the sermon by whether or not it's entertaining. Don't do that. Whether they're good jokes, don't do that. Here's how you do it. Did it put the text right in front of me? Right? I mean, did, did the sermon rub my nose in the text? Did it immerse me in the text? Or did it just use, use like a springboard? You know, here's the Bible. Now, no, here's what I want to say. No, is it really in the text? Does it tell me how I ought to live and urge me to do it? That's the preaching, exhortation. And did it explain it so that I understood it better than before? That's the teaching. 
Now, I have to say that this is not always the top priority for every pastor. You can be really praising God that we try to do that here. But some churches, it's not their priority, and they look down upon preaching, and they're like, oh, when will he finish? That's not you, I hope. So pray, please pray, not just for us, but pray for the churches in the area, because this is how our society will change. All right, so pray for us. Fourth point, very briefly, his diligence. Timothy needs to be diligent, that is to say he needs to realize what a high priority this is, and to keep doing it. So verse 15, practice these things. Again, it's, it's present tense, continual. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. He keeps on saying persist, immerse, practice. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Persevere in these things. Because if you do, you'll save yourself and your hearers. That's an extraordinary thing to say, because we surely can't save ourselves. Only God can save. But I think what he means is, is this sense, that there's not anything we can do to merit salvation, obviously. But because God saves through the gospel, there's a real sense in which if Timothy perseveres in preaching and teaching the gospel, working out you know, the gospel in his own life, he will, in that sense, save himself and those who hear. They will hear the gospel. They'll, they'll put their trust in Christ. So those who listen and who watch his life will be saved because his life lives out the gospel. Right? His life lives it out and it has integrity and truth. So Timothy, pay attention. This is really important. Don't get distracted by those secondary things. Even if they're worthy. We do lots of things as pastors, and they're, they're worthy things, but don't get distracted by the main thing, which is your preaching and your teaching. And those of us who are pastors, pay attention, like I've said, and you guys, watch us, and keep us accountable, and expect us to take this thing seriously, and expect us in our private lives to be teachers who learn, and in our outer life, setting an example in these things. Godly speech, Christ-like living, and faithfulness, and love, and purity, and then we make it work in our Bible teaching, and we keep going at it, and if you expect your pastors to be like that, you know, it'll be like going to that second office, where things were good and well done, and we'll get better, and it'll be our, it is, it's already our culture at ECG, but it'll continue being our culture, and we'll get better at it. You follow? And then as you see that, you follow, you follow the example that, that we said. This is a church where, where we have marvelous expectations and uh, it's a privilege to be here. Let's, let's pray. Let's just allow ourselves to be thinking about God's word and what we've heard this morning. Let's consider how we can apply it to our lives. And just in silence we can pray, and then I'll, I'll close. We've put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. And we praise you, Lord God, that it's your purpose to rescue men and women from slavery to sin. We thank you for your marvelous, powerful gospel. We thank you for your spirit applying that gospel to our lives. And we pray that in this church, you would give us and continue to give us leadership which displays the gospel in life and is faithful to the gospel in teaching and preaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.